Good morning, everybody. My name is Terry. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you are here for the first time, or maybe you came to Easter Sunday last Sunday and you decided to come back, welcome. We're excited that you decided to be a part of our church today. As we start this brand new message series entitled Wayward, and and let me tell you where we're going for the next three to four weeks. Um, What we're doing is is we're kind of jumping off of last week. If you were here last week, you remember me saying, at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there were 100 true followers of Jesus at that moment. And today, as it rests, we have 2.3 billion followers of Jesus. And when we think about how did that happen, how in immense persecution, how did this this group of fishermen uh, continue to be able to fan the flames of the truth that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, the Son of God, and how did that spread across the globe? And you saw from that bumper video, what what happened is, is during a time of immense persecution by Rome, um, in order to be able to talk in a safe place, Christians used to draw one half of a fish, and then if someone saw that and they drew the other half, it meant we're safe. We can have these conversations. We can talk about faith. Now, what I find uh, amazing, and yes, uh, like our, our times today are, are an interesting time, but the truth is, is that here where we live, um, we have the freedom to be able to talk about our faith. We, and some of you might be like, no, we don't. No, well, no, in comparison to other places of the world, um, we're, we're not fearful that if we share about faith that we're going to be thrown in prison forever, which exists in different places here in this world. Um, But there's a lot of us as Christians that we choose not to for a lot of different reasons. And and we kind of have all of our thoughts and opinions. What I thought it would be great is is to be able to talk as a church, um, not necessarily um, today about a strategy or a plan, but a, a purpose and a reason. Like, you know, is it important to share our faith? Why should we share our faith? Why don't we share about our faith? What are some of those reasons? But most importantly... Terry, what does God really have to say about this? And does he have a strategy or a plan that we can feel comfortable with and really understand and say, I get it? And and if if you have some of those same thoughts, well, today my hope is is that they are answered for you and that we learn a lot together. But in order to kick this off, um, we're going to have a little bit of fun because I've got some statistics that I want to be able to share with you. And if you're not a Christian, I want you to lean in because um, you're going to see a whole lot about us as Christians that doesn't make sense. Um, we, 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 we're a fickled mess, we are as Christians. We're the only army that shoots itself. Yes, that's us. And, and so we're, we're going to point our fingers at ourselves here for a little bit um, because we got a whole lot of work to do when it comes to understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So without kind of talking more, let's look at some statistics. 26% of people who don't follow Jesus are still curious about Jesus. Now, I love that. And, and in essence, one quarter of the individuals who are not Christians in this world, they say that they still are interested to know a thing or two about Jesus. Like, he, he, was, he was so important of enough figure that they're fascinated by whether his teachings or who he was. And so when we think about individuals that are in our neighborhoods or communities that, you know, are not going to church or not following Jesus, one quarter of them still want to know about Jesus. It goes on. 36% of people who don't follow Jesus under the age of 40 are curious about Jesus. Isn't this amazing? That many in the wiser generation, they look at the younger generation and they go, well, it's just not what it used to be. You know, like, you know, just, just the, the church just continues to get smaller and smaller. The younger generation just doesn't understand. Well, actually, the younger generation are really interested in the things of Jesus. They really want to know more about what he has to say. Now, I find this one really fascinating. 79% of people who don't follow Jesus are open to a friend about faith. Three quarters of individuals who don't believe in Jesus basically share and say that if I have a friend who has faith, I'm open to talking to them about it. And so for all of us as followers of Jesus, when we think about sharing faith, isn't it amazing that three quarters of our friends are actually open to having a conversation with us? Now, if you're not a Christian, I want you to watch this because this is where we're a hot mess, okay? So just, just wait. Just watch us, okay? I can't believe it. Yes, I'm going to out us. You ready? Surveys tell us that 96% of Christians believe it's important to share their faith. And all God's people said, amen. Get ready. Get ready, okay? 
In just a couple of slides, all of you who said amen, you're on the hook, all right? Now let's dig in a little deeper in this next one, and then we're going to get to it. However, 28% of all Christians and 46% under the age of 40 strongly, first of all, to believe it's wrong to share your faith with someone of a different faith. So right off the bat, we, we say that 96% of all Christians say we should share our faith. But then there, well, there's a caveat. And, and I'll give you a pass on this one, okay? Because we have a lot of friends in this, that, that are strong in their faith, and, and, we, and we live in a culture now that says, hey, hey, be careful, you know, they have a, they have a faith, and so, you know, like, don't, don't push your faith on someone else's faith. I, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it, okay? Fine, fine, I'll give you a pass on that one. But all you who said amen, here's a step. Remember, 96% of all Christians say we should share our faith. Over 90% of Christians do not consistently share their faith on a monthly basis. So for you non-Christians, all of us Christians, we say, amen, Pastor Terry, we should share our faith. I ain't going to do it. And it's true. Now, there's a lot of us in this room that we're going to fake it until we make it. We're saying, no, 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 I do, I do, I do, Pastor Terry. But if we're really honest with ourselves, is sharing our faith a priority in our lives? And I would tell you, statistically proven, the answer is no. And you might ask the question, why? Why is it that so many of us that are Christians, we just, Terry, ain't going to do it? That's up for the pastors. The, the pastors should do that. Well, let me tell you some of the reasons why. Many of us have a fear of rejection. There's a lot of individuals in this room, Pastor Terry, I can't share my faith because, you know, my family, you know, they'll reject me. My friends, they'll reject me. Um, it's difficult. I would say the younger generation, your 19, your 20-year-olds, your 25-year-olds, you're out with your friends. This, Pastor Terry, it's really hard to stand up for your faith when, when you're out. And the truth is, is the younger generation who doesn't go to church and doesn't follow the teaching of Jesus, then they're not getting a source of wisdom being poured into them. Their wisdom is coming from TikTok and social media. And I will tell you, be careful. And I don't mean that jokingly, I'm just saying be careful because, and you might say, well, no, that's not true. Do you know that the younger generation, and I forget what generation is, most of the news that they received comes from TikTok? But we know that everything on TikTok is true. So my point is the younger generation, if you're a young Christian in this room, you've got to be careful because what happens is, is that there's a lot of decisions that are being made in younger circles that are not wise because you don't have a source of wisdom being poured in. And if you're a young Christian and you're getting sources of wisdom and you're like, wow, I just learned in church that Jesus said this and all my friends want to do this. Well, Pastor Terry, it's really hard to stand for my faith when I'm sitting in a car with three people who want to do something. And we put ourselves in a position where we're fearful of rejection in that moment. I get it. We're insecure. Many of us, we have insecurity. In today's day and age, Pastor Terry, it's too political. I mean, if I let people know that I'm a strong Christian, they're going to judge me. They're going to label me. Now, if you're not a Christian, I want you to hear me really quick. Okay, you, you have no authority. You know, you, I've got nothing in your life, right? You're not a Christian. I'm a pastor. You're like, hey, I'm just here just to be able to be a witness. Fine. But if you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus in this room, you are on the hook because what you're saying is, is that I believe in what Pastor Terry believes. I believe that the God, God and his word is truth and I'm supposed to follow truth. Well, I want to share with you the truth of something is, is that we don't have a right as Christians to put labels on anybody. And the reason why we can't do that is, is because we're not allowed to judge any singular person. How many of you have ever been judged before? A lot of hands. How many of you ever judged someone? I'm proud of you. The last two services, there were a bunch of chickens. I said, how many of you ever judged someone? And boy, those hands went down. Not me, Pastor Terry. I'm just perfect. I, you know, this, that. If you're not a Christian, we Christians love to judge. We love to judge other individuals. We love to judge other people. We love to other, judge other programs. I mean, heck, some of you judged my sweater this morning when you came in. We do this. We love to judge. But the truth of the matter is, and we know this by the authority of Scripture is, is that only God has the right to judge a heart. So you can stop making fun of my sweater, okay? Amen. Someone said that's right. <laughs> it is a nice blue, don't you think? No, I'm just teasing. Anyway. But many of us, it's become too political and we have a lot of judgment going on. We have offense to others, lack of knowledge, ambivalence, ambiguity, and one of the biggest things is, is we have a fear. 
We have a fear of sharing our faith. And, and I think that fear goes to the reality that we just have a lack of knowledge. You know, Pastor Terry, I, 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 I'm afraid to share my faith because I really don't know enough. And if I start sharing my faith, I'm going to send them to hell because I don't know what I'm talking about. And, and I'm going to get done talking to them about Jesus and they're going to walk away feeling condemned. And so I would just rather not say anything. And so all of those are reasons why we don't like to share our faith. And so if you can connect with some of that list, here's the good news. The good news is what we're going to do today, we're going to learn together what Jesus actually has to say about what it means to actually share your faith, because I don't think we have it right, and then how we're to do it, okay? So let's go to our anchor passage. For those of you who are Christians, you know this. This is Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and Jesus Christ is about to ascend and go to heaven. And before he does, he has a one final command he wants to give us. Let's take a look. He says, therefore, I want you to go and make disciples. Now, many of you, you read that, you have no idea what that means. We're going to touch on it in a second. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you, always, even to the end of age. Now, I think part of the reason that we freak out is, is when we read that, we see him say, go and make disciples, and we don't understand what that means. But then the second thing is, he says, hey, now teach all these people all the commands I've given you. And the problem is, is that most Christians don't even know all the commands that Jesus has given Many of us, we don't feel equipped or qualified to be able to tell people about Jesus because we don't know enough about Jesus. And so right off the bat, we throw our hands up and go, I'm out. I'm not going to do it. I, I just am afraid. But I want you to focus on the bottom half of that scripture that you see on the screen right now. What does Jesus say? It's almost as if Jesus was looking at me and saying, Terry, hey, go make disciples. And look, I get it. I, I want you to try your best to teach everybody the commands that I've given. And I know you're not going to remember all of them. And I know you don't know all of them. Because my father's commands and my commands, there's a lot. So when you start freaking out and start thinking I shouldn't do this, I want you to remember something. I'm with you. Terry, did you hear what I said? When you think that you've got to have all the right words and you think that it's all about you, no, 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 I'm with you. You don't have to have all the right words. You don't have to know everything. That, that, that's kind of the saving grace of this, Terry, is you, when you forget all the commands and you're like, I, I just, I, I'm, I don't know what to do. I'm with you. Yeah, but, but Jesus, you're really busy. You got a lot of things you got going on, so there's some days that you're not with me. No, 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 no. Not only am I with you, but I'm with you to the end of the age. Dang it, he trumped me again. That means you're with me at all times? Yes. That means he's with you when you're sinning. Some of you are like, dang. I better think twice before I do that again. But I love this. Now, for some of us in the room, okay, Terry, Jesus is with us. When, when I think about that, all right, I can relax. Now, what does it mean to go and make disciples? I love this. You ready? Here's what Jesus actually meant. The first one a lot of us have learned. Go means as you're going. Go doesn't mean one time. Go doesn't mean they're a target. I'm a man. I am a goal-oriented creature. You give me a goal, I'm on it. I'm there. I'm a fixer. I'll go do it. And the problem is, in my younger years, I used to look at go, and I used to think, okay, you've got a problem, and I'm going to come fix it for you. That was my strategy to share my faith. You're a sinner. You don't have Jesus. Let me tell you all about him. Bad strategy. Because I was theologically inaccurate. That was not what Jesus was saying to do. What he was saying is, Terry, as you go in your life, as you live Monday through Saturday, as you go to Publix where shopping is a pleasure and the Boar's Head turkey subs are on sale this week, can I get an amen? Amen. As you go, I want you to then make disciples. You see, it's less about a specific time and a specific moment, and it's more about how you live your life. And I love the second thing that he says. He goes, as you're going, Terry, I want you to inspire others to want to learn more about me. Well, how do I do that? You see, Terry, they go hand in hand. Because if you go in such a way to where you are a follower of me, that you love me, that you understand that every day is a gift from me, that you understand that I'm alive and because of that you will never perish eternally, 
I mean, how much joy can we have? How many of you in this room or watching online are facing a sickness, and it could be a sickness that is unknown, and, and it could end your life, but aren't you thankful and have joy and peace today to, to know that, you know what, death can't keep me down because he's alive, I will be alive? And when you have that joy, then it all makes sense. As I go, I have that joy. And as I'm joyful, people are going to look and say, man, Pastor Terry's weird. He's got a smile on his face. I mean, he, he, he actually calls people by their name. It's like he actually cares about people. I mean, doesn't he understand that in our culture, we don't talk about people's names because we don't know them and we keep to ourselves? Like, why does he keep doing that? And man, he continues to talk to them and he continues to actually engage them and ask them questions about themselves. Like, what does he care? He's too busy. He's got things to do. Why is he pausing and actually showing concern for someone else? It's because Jesus calls me to. And when you live like that, then the people around, they notice you. Here's the thing I tell Christians all the time. If you're not a Christian, listen up. It is the easiest time ever to share your faith. Because it's such a dark world right now to where people don't care about one another and everybody is to themselves. If you just are willing as a Christian to say, you know what, I'm going to try and care about a person today. If you do that, people are going to see Jesus. It was really hard in the 50s and the 60s in the South. Everybody was so kind and loving. Here's some sweet tea. I mean, it was, it was amazing. But now it's not like that. So Jesus says, actually inspire someone to want to talk about me. Now, there's a guy by the name of Simon Peter. You remember him, the fisherman? And Simon Peter, he followed Jesus, he watched Jesus, he knows a thing or two about Jesus. Do you know that he actually, he pens something to encourage us? And he wanted us to know what it means to share our faith. And if you're, if you're not a Christian, listen up, because we get this wrong as Christians all the time. We have focused on, on a one passage and we forgot the first part and we focused on the second part, and we messed it all up. So I want you to see this, and I want you to see what Simon Peter has to say about sharing faith. In 1 Peter 3.15, he said, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, and if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Now, here's what's happened. What's happened is we've used this scripture in the church from an apologetic standpoint, to make every Christian know that you need to be ready to share your faith every single moment. So what Christians then did is they were like, I gotta learn an outline to know all the right scriptures and the right ways to be able to tell someone about Jesus. So I gotta be ready, it's a test, it's a quiz. Every day I'm gonna be quizzed and so I gotta make sure I have this outline. How many of you type A's in this room, you have stressed out because you forgot number three on the outline of how to share your faith? It happens. But did you notice the first part of that scripture? Because we messed it up. Do you know what Simon Peter actually was saying? He says this, instead you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Do you understand what that meant? Simon Peter says, Terry, look, as you're going, glorify God in everything that you do. And as you're going, then here's what's going to happen someone is going to ask you about the hope that you're displaying and then be ready to talk about that. So Simon Peter wasn't saying have a five-point evangelism plan ready to go. What he was really saying is they're going to notice that you're really weird and that you stand out and that you have joy and be ready to talk about why you have that joy. And so it's really simple. Jesus, I have Jesus I used to know Jesus by name, now I know him as Lord. And because I know him as Lord, let me tell you what he's done in my life. He has radically changed my life. I didn't want to be a pastor, he forced me to be a pastor. He performed two miracles that made me be a pastor and I still told Jesus I don't want to do it. That's what God did, so he radically changed my whole life and I'm here to tell you today, if you were to ask me is Jesus real, there is no doubt in my mind, and I would tell you it's the best decision I ever made in my life. That's what it means to share your faith. I didn't come out with a five-point outline. I could, but I don't know too many people that want to hear a five-point outline. I want them, they want to know what God's done in your life. By the way, if you're not a Christian, there are some Christians that if they were asked, 
you might not want to hear their answer because they don't have a lot of joy in their heart right now. And it could be because they really don't know what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus. I'm just saying. And Barna, George Barna, he wrote a book, and he's, he's, a, he's a research guru, and they have an organization, and they do statistical research, not only for nonprofit, but also in the profit world. And he wrote a book, and it's called Reviving Evangelism. And I want you to see this. In Barna's book, Reviving Evangelism, based upon their research, they asked individuals that don't follow Jesus, what do those that don't follow Jesus value in a person that would talk about Jesus? So people who don't follow Jesus, what do they value in people who do follow Jesus, okay? I love the answers. You ready? Here are the three answers. Number one, people who don't follow Jesus would value Jesus followers who listen without judgment. Newsflash, if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have a right to judge anybody. But do you hear what non-Christians are saying about Christians? They're saying that we're a bunch of judgmental individuals. And you know what? They're right. Because we're human. That means they watch us on social media. They watch us in the hallways of church. And when we talk about someone, when we judge someone, when we talk about people outside the church and we talk to them in a negative fashion, they look at us and go, well, that's how they feel about us. Why should we listen to anything they have to say? The second thing they say is this. We wish that Jesus' followers would allow us to draw our own conclusions. Now, this is a good one because they're right. I'm guilty. Just ask my wife. When she has a problem, she opens her mouth, she says three words, and I've already diagnosed it. I already have the problem. She doesn't need to use any more words. I can fix her. And most individuals, when we have someone who's not a follower of Jesus who talks to us and starts asking us about faith, We interrupt them and we say, well, let me tell you about Jesus. You got it all wrong. Let me tell you what you need to think. And meanwhile, they're just like, you know, I am an adult. You know, I appreciate that you know Jesus, but, you know, I was just wanting to have a conversation. And apparently my, what I have to say doesn't matter. So if what I have to say doesn't matter, why should I value what you have to say? The third thing is, is that they say, I wish that Christians would have confidence in sharing their own perspective. This blew my mind. Do you know what they were really saying? I just wish Christians actually believed in what they talked about. I wish Christians actually followed what they preached. Because if they did, they would talk about Jesus more. If you ever saw Penn and Teller, you know, the the magician act, and, and I think it was Penn who came out because there was someone who came at the end of of one of his magic acts and they shared emphatically with him about Jesus and and probably did it the way that I would not encourage, but basically just told Penn, look, if you don't follow Jesus, you're going to hell. And, you know, it doesn't have a relationship. But I love what Penn said because he addressed this. Because Penn comes out and he does a video blog and he actually came out and said, I want to tell you that I, I appreciated what he said. Because I know this, he was so passionate about what he believed And he believed that if you don't know Jesus, then you are going to go to hell. And because he believed that, he cared enough about me, because I told him that I didn't believe in Jesus, he actually cared so much about me, he was so emphatic of wanting me to believe in Jesus. And I appreciated it, because he believed in what he said, and he cared enough about me to share it. So I respect that. And I would say there were many of us in this room that, If actually someone found out we were a Christian, they would look at us and go, how could you believe that and not tell me about this? We have to have more confidence in what we believe. Now, for some of us, we're overwhelmed. We feel, oh, gosh, great, Terry. Thanks a lot. My toes are stepped on again. I appreciate that. But I want to simplify this for you. Because I think what Jesus did is is he made it really simple. I think we complicate things, and I think Jesus has a simple way of doing things. Do you know what I believe that Jesus Christ, when he tells us to share our faith, what he really talks about? He knows this, that people who don't know him, what they're looking for, they're really looking for friends. Individuals who don't follow Jesus are looking to people of Jesus for friends. No, they don't, Terry. That's not, well, let's define what a friend is, okay? Before you judge me, ha, ha, ha. 
before you judge me, let's define what a friend is. You ready? A friend is a person whom one knows and with whom one has a bond of mutual affection. That's a friend. And so what Jesus said is, I want you to go and I want you to build friendships. Some of you are like, no, he didn't. Well, do you know what Jesus' nickname was? Friend. Jesus was all about being a friend. No, he wasn't, Pastor Terry. How can you prove it? Okay, I'll prove it. Around in the circles, Jesus Christ was doing ministry, and he developed this nickname as friend. And I want you to see it. This is Matthew eleven sixteen nineteen. 16, 19. This is Jesus talking. He says this, to what can I compare this generation? He's talking to the religious leaders and everything. To what can I compare this generation? It's like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends, we played wedding songs and you didn't dance. So we played funeral songs and you didn't mourn. For John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating and drinking, and yet you say he was possessed by a demon. And the Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a what? Friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Can you go back one screen, guys? I want to show this. Jesus said, you call me a friend, not just a friend. You call me a friend of tax collectors. By the way, tax collectors were the worst of the worst. You call me a friend of tax collectors and all sinners. Fine. You want to call me that? Happy to hold that label. Because wisdom, next slide, is shown to be right by its results. Do you know what that means for you and I? It means this. That if we were to seek friendships, not with just people that think like us, talk like us, and amen us, but that we would seek friendships with individuals who don't think like us, don't talk like us, don't have the same backgrounds, that we might just actually model the mission Jesus had because Jesus modeled his mission. So if you're here and you want the, Terry, just I'm the type A, I need my notes. What do we need to do? I think it's really simple for some of us in this room. The first thing we need to start doing is seek friendship because that's what Jesus did. No, he didn't, Terry. He had, he had a bigger plan. No, 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 no. He sought friendship. Do you want me to prove it to you? I love this. Some of you learned this story in, in, in Sunday school long ago when you were a little kid. Luke chapter 19, verse 5, 6. Watch Jesus. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. By the way, Zacchaeus was a tax collector and a cheat. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I'm going to go to your house today. And Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Jesus went to Jericho, and he's walking through Jericho, and he looked up, and he knew Zacchaeus by name, and he said, hey, come down here. I want to get to know you more. How many of us have room for one more friend? How many of us actually think about today, what is one new friendship that I can seek? And some of you, the problem is, is many of us, we think of friends selfishly. I'm guilty. We think of building friendships so I can get something out of that friendship. We reject certain friendships because we don't connect and we're not going to get anything out of it. But that's not what seeking a friendship really is about. Seeking a friendship is not just about what I can get. Seeking a friendship is far more, and Jesus was trying to model it. We have all different kinds of friends. Some of us have amazing friends that pour into us, and that's awesome. But there's another category of friends. How many of you know someone who needs a friend today? How many of you have a child, a son, or a daughter who needs a friend today? How many of you have a mom or a dad who is widowed who needs a friend today? You, think, you see, I think Jesus had a strategy. You need to seek friendship, but not for yourselves. You need to seek to bless within that friendship. Well, Terry, was Jesus really about that? Yes. Because there's a story in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 13, where one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and do what? Bless them. There were parents bringing their kids to develop a friendship with Jesus. And Jesus blessed them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. They said, he's too busy. He doesn't have time to make friends with you. And do you know what Jesus said in that moment? Don't you dare. Let the children come to me. 
Because when you welcome a child like this, it's as if you are doing what? Welcoming God. So Jesus was really saying, look, you need to seek friendship and you need to seek to bless the friends that you make. Because when you do that, it's like you understand my father. Some of you are like, well, Terry, was that a part of his plan from the beginning? Yes, because God gives us insight into this plan. And I want you to see the Old Testament and how it ties all together. Hang with me. This is Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and he'll do what? I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families on earth will be what? Blessed through you. Two things, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. So Jesus said before he left, go, as you're going, make friendships. Make friendships, because when you make a friend, they're going to know your heart, and when they know your heart, they're going to be inspired to talk to you about what drives your life. Now some of you are like, Terry, it can't be that easy. No, it is. Because even today, as you head to Publix for that special on the Boar's Head Turkey Sub, you can make a friend. It can't be that easy. Yes, because you know when Jesus was going through Jericho, watch this. Jesus entered Jericho and he was just passing through. You see, Jesus didn't go to Jericho to meet Zacchaeus. Jesus was going through through Jericho to get to something else. And because Jesus was all about his father's mission and about blessing others, he was walking through and he saw Zacchaeus, a tax collector, in a tree. And he said, you know what? It's far more important for me to have a new friend and bless him than it is for me to get to my next appointment. You see, this moment was not on Jesus' Google calendar. And Zacchaeus was not a target to be won. You see, Jesus was on mission all times, and he was a friend. And all he did was wherever he went, he was a friend to others. More importantly, he was a friend who wanted to bless others. So here's my question for you today. When was the last time you made a new friend? When was the last time you thought about developing developing a friendship with someone for the purpose of not receiving, but giving. When was the last time you got out of what is happening in your life for just a moment to think about what God might actually want in your life? Because don't you think if we can get out of our head in our week-to-week rhythm and, and what's happening in my life, and if we could just allow God a little bit of room to move, he might better our lives? I had that experience this week. Many of you know my son, he plays baseball. And the coach asked me if I would help a little bit, and so he said, would you announce a game? And I said, sure, and and let me set the scene. I know a lot of the parents, and, and here's a truth that we pastors know. We are party killers. Nobody wants the pastor at their party. We also know this. That usually at events when a lot of individuals are together outside of church, you don't want the pastor coming up. I know this. At the baseball games, I used to walk up because I would just seek to, you know, make a new friend, and I'd walk up, and the conversation would die down, and I'd walk up and say, hey, how are you? They'd be like, hey, good to see you. I'd be like, you guys can keep talking. They're like, no. And then as soon as I walk away, the conversation goes, I get it, I get it. Because there is a label on us as pastors that we're judgmental and that you can't be yourself and be a sinner in front of a pastor. Newsflash, I'm a sinner too. So the reason why I say it changed for me this week is because the coach asked me if I would announce a game. And, and truth be told, I look at you know building relationships with a lot of the parents and the families because I know that's what Jesus would want. And it's hard sometimes because I'm a pastor. So I was up there and 
Most people don't know this, but 20 years ago, I used to announce baseball games. I was a baseball coach. I was in baseball, so I've announced games before. And so I got up there, and, you know, we pastors like to talk. And I grabbed the microphone, and I did what I had normally done. And it surprised a lot of people because they weren't expecting that from a pastor. So all week long, I kept getting, can you announce this game? Can you announce this game? And, and on Thursday, I remember standing in the bitter cold because God took spring away. <laughs> and I remember I prayed because here's what I noticed. In four days' time, by me just announcing baseball games, I had the privilege of encouraging other families' kids by calling out their names when they had success. And the families appreciated that because I didn't have to do that, but I looked for opportunities to be able to encourage. And all of a sudden, when I would come down on Monday and on Tuesday, I had parents who usually avoided me come right up to me and say, thank you so much. And all of a sudden, I was able to have a conversation because I wasn't a unicorn with three heads. And by Thursday, I was standing there and I was saying, God, how in your infinite wisdom you would open the door for me to do this so that I can build relationships and friendships with so many more people than I could count this week. I would have never planned it that way, never thought it was possible, but you have an amazing plan. And all I have to do is be available. You see, that's what it means to go make disciples. It's not a five-point plan. It's not about memorizing the Bible and having all the answers. It's about being ready and available to seek a friendship so that you could bless them. And when you're able to bless them and when they ask you about why you're so different and why it is that you live your life the way that you do, that you just speak from the heart and say, you know what, the truth is I'm learning more about Jesus and the more I learn and the more I apply, I, the better my life is. And that's just the truth. And when you say those kind of things from a heart, people listen. And people might just listen enough to where it changes their life. That's what it means to share your faith. Could you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this message. And um, God, I thank you for every person in this room. And God, my heart grieves when I see that statistic of 90% of Christians not willing to share their faith on a month-to-month -month basis. And God, I know why, because we have so many misconceptions about what that means. I pray today that we would all be willing to seek out a friend, that we would care for them, that we would listen to them, and that we would live our lives as we're going in such a way to where it inspires them to ask about you. And when they do that, we can simply share about what you've done in our lives and so that maybe, just maybe, as your Holy Spirit works, that they would also want to trust you as Lord and Savior. God, thank you for a simple plan. And I pray that we'd be willing to do it. We honor you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.